Come along now. Enter the special world of Sports Afield. The next best thing to being outdoors. Your Sports Afield reporters are two of the nation's leaders in the outdoor field. Homer Circle, one of America's foremost authorities on fish and fishing. Ritz Gresham, author, outdoorsman, and authority on shooting and hunting. Sports Afield is brought to you in part by your Kmart Sports Center with quality brand names at Kmart prices. This is Gritz Gresham. On today's special edition of Sports Afield, we'll revisit the Idaho Wilderness Homestead of Buckskin Bill, last of the old mountain men. We'll also meet a most remarkable independent woman of the West, Frances Wisner. Stay with us. The clear, perfect skies of autumn in Idaho. This flight is only the start of a long journey that I'm taking to the heart of one of the most extensive, most rugged wildernesses in America. I'm Gritz Gresham, and I'm flying above the Salmon River Mountains, named for the Whitewater River that drains them. Nearly all of this region is national forest, a place reserved for trees and wildlife, and people in search of escape and quiet. We're dropping for a difficult landing in the Canyon of the Salmon, one of the deepest and narrowest canyons on Earth. Along its winding course, there are only a few places flat enough and large enough for an airstrip. There are no roads in this part of the canyon. From here on, all travel is by foot, horse, or boat. We've landed at an isolated guest ranch, where sportsmen come for the great hunting and fishing in the surrounding wilderness. I've made many trips to the salmon myself, just for the game and fish. But this time, I've come here for another reason. I still have several miles to go, and I'll cover them alone, on horseback. The trail winds along the canyon floor, through tall forest of pine and Douglas fir. The stillness and fading warmth of autumn seem to carry a warning. In a few weeks, this wild country will be closed in, frozen, the year finished. I'm making this journey to take a last look at the homestead of Sylvan Hart, better known as Buckskin Bill. Hart was a fascinating, independent, almost mythical character, a living mountain man in the 20th century. He was born in 1906 in what later would become Oklahoma. At 28, he came to the Salmon River to prospect for gold and decided to stay here the rest of his life by himself. Two years ago, traveling by boat, I made a special trip here to meet him. Buckskin, I've been looking forward to this. Rich Gray. Where is it you hail from? I'm from Louisiana. Well, I'll be darn it. I've been on the salt. Have you? Where you been? Shreveport. Well, I'm not far from there, just below, Natchitoches. Mm-hmm. Yep. Got a good looking place here. Mm hmm Come on up. When you ride through this unspoiled country, you sense its remarkable abundance. Living here alone for 45 years, Hart gathered the raw materials of nature and made everything he needed shelter, clothing, and food. He grew a large garden, most of it planted in root vegetables, which he stored for use in the winter. He not only did everything for himself, he also made the tools to do it with. Axes, adzes, picks, pliers, hacksaws, and hammers. He made them at his forge, heating and reshaping the scrap metal he found at abandoned mines and mills in the wilderness around him. Hart was a skilled craftsman in the best tradition of frontier America. The most remarkable examples of his craftsmanship were not the tools he made, but the guns he designed and built, a pistol, several rifles, and a musket. He used them all his life here in hunting to get the meat, furs, and leather he needed. The guns were not only useful, but gracefully designed with embossed metalwork and inlays of antler or horn on the stocks. It seems an incredible feat to have done such precise work under primitive conditions here in the wilderness. For a long time, I'd heard of his work, and my interest in guns and shooting was really what brought me here to meet him. 
that trip two years ago. I'm glad I got to see his guns and finally to shoot them. That other one. That's a 64 caliber. Man, that is a big gun. Well, it's it a is. Cannon. It's about, uh, it's about right. It's about what you need is for, it? for a good big beer, deer, or an elk. And here's a 45 70 flip-up stock. Mm -hmm. there's, there's by the lot. I just made this part, and then I made a double, double set trigger there. Mm -hmm. You see, for that. You got. Uh... Here's a good casting of, of um, the cartridge brass. That's high brass. You uh -huh. see? That's about as good as. Did brass. you make the butt stock out of the same thing? Mm -hmm. Well, almost the same thing. This is navy, uh, marine brass. You see, mm -hmm. that's a good grade of brass. It's a mighty fancy butt stock. Mm hmm. Yeah, you have it, you, it, it puts the stock to the same place your shoulder every time. Mm-hmm. Any chance of shooting these guns? Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we just might do that. We just might do that. I'd love that. This time I arrive at the back gate by the garden, which the wilderness has already begun to erase. Sylvan Hart, Buckskin Bill, died here on his homestead last spring. Hart has been gone now for only a few months, but his garden has filled with weeds through the summer. Quickly, nature is reclaiming what he borrowed, the land that he used and took care of temporarily. Through the decades of his life here, the many buildings that he made weathered handsomely. The cookhouse, the workshop, the adobe dwelling with its ladder to his sleeping porch. In many ways, these buildings of his are profound reminders of our American past, our pioneering spirit. Reminders as great as all the granite monuments to statesmen and national heroes. His forge once roared, filled with fire. His hammer once rang on his anvil, echoing on the walls of the canyon, proclaiming his energy and his patient industry. Through the years, he brought to life his vision of how a man should live, simply, independently, in concert with nature. But now, the last living sign of domestication, his cat. Without him, it probably won't survive the winter. Here, at this table, is where we sat to fire several of the guns that he built. The most impressive to me was a huge percussion cap musket, a three gauge loaded with a six ounce lead ball. The musket itself had a weight of 30 pounds, necessary to reduce the tremendous recoil. Well, the cap fires, uh, the cap fires the charge. Everything goes. I'm gonna have to catch you back here when he goes off. No, let me, uh, just let me fall. All right, where mm -hmm. you gonna hold on the target? Uh, just under the bullseye at right. six o'clock. Let me see you do it. Mm -hmm. Let's have it. Hart died in April 1980, at the end of a long winter. Here, on the homestead that he shaped and loved, he's buried, near his garden and his house and the workshop where he built his guns. Sylvan Hart, a man who made us hesitate and wonder how many of us are using our time, our lives, as wisely and well as he used his. What we're really searching for when we hunt or fish, hike or camp, what for us is only an interlude, all too short, this for him was a way of life. And that same way of life continues to exist for a proud, resourceful woman who still lives in the Salmon Canyon, alone. We'll visit her in just a moment. The Canyon of the Salmon River in Idaho, with its brilliant leaves and golden grass, now, in autumn, it's one of the most beautiful places in America. I'm heading several more miles upriver, and there's still no road. This is solid wilderness. I'm going to visit a friend, an independent woman named Frances Wisner. Until Sylvan Hart died, she was his nearest neighbor. She came to the Salmon River in 1940 from Texas and has lived here alone since her husband died in 1974. She is self-reliant, 
getting mail and a few supplies from an airplane that lands occasionally on her ranch. Her house is situated on a sloping bench just above the river at a place called Campbell's Ferry, where a flatboat once carried miners and trappers across the water. Hi there. Howdy. And the place looks better than ever. Well, same old mess. Oh. Beautiful. You got time for coffee? Coffee? I came to spend a month. Oh, good. <laughs> How was the trail? Trail was good shape. Good shape. Yeah. Good. They got a good crew working for him now. Have you seen any bears around? Well, right now I don't see any, but look at the trees, what they've been doing. I noticed them coming in. Those apple trees are really taking a beating this year, haven't they? Yeah. No joke. I get five boxes of apples a year, but this year I got about 15 apples. They took them. Lots of applesauce. Not out of 15 apples, I won't. <laughs> Let's no, get that coffee. No applesauce, lots of coffee. Okay, I can't get over this weather. Well, I can't either, and I love it. I think I'll go in with you and help bring it out and watch the tea kettle Good boil. deal. Good deal. Inside, Frances shows me the many firearms she owns, several of them very old. They're necessary for life here in the wilderness, sometimes for self-protection, but mostly for hunting. What a girl. Now, I was looking at that picture in your album of the big elk that you killed. Now, which one of these guns did you shoot it with? Well, the it only gun like... anyone going elk hunting needs to take. It looked like the lever action. Well, sure. Was that it? Because so far as the gun and the heavy and the kick, which a lot of these hunters think if a gun don't bruise their shoulder, it won't kill anything. Have you ever thought you were going to have to use one of these guns on somebody? Well... Living out here by yourself? I've always thought if I had to, I could. But to want to shoot anyone, no. One poor ignorant creature one time thought I was still asleep, and I wasn't. And when he'd eased himself into the kitchen door and me screeching and get out, but he was being careful to sneak in. And he found me standing in the door there with this little baby in my hand. And I just did that, and he left. Uh, that persuaded him to go. I didn't tell him to leave, but I certainly didn't invite him in. I don't think you had to tell him. I, I thought that was clear enough. Francis has a garden, a raspberry patch, and an orchard, which all too often is raided by bears. She enjoys seeing them, but wants also to protect her crop. She's tried almost everything to frighten them away when the fruit is ripe. Then I hung 10 cans, a five gallon square, the kind of gas and kerosene come in. Mm -hmm. And I ringed the tree with those things. On one of the pear trees, I had two layers of 10 cans, but just hung by the, the handle. A bear knocks 10 cans this way and goes up through them. Don't pay attention to it. Just to make the noise. The noise didn't bother him, but it woke me up. And when he leaves the tree, he'd just get over to the trunk and just turn loose, hit cans, bounce, hit the ground, and I'm in the house thinking, why don't I get some sleep? So I took the cans down. Where did you see that grizzly that you showed me the picture of? <laughs> You're standing right where he was. Right here? Yep, these trees are in the picture. Well, you know, most of the people don't think there are any grizzlies in this country. Well, even a lot of biologists don't because... They don't take the time. You've been here several days, and you haven't seen any. Well, I haven't either at the same time, but I've been here 40 years, and I've seen them a lot of times. Well, there's no mistake in that picture. That's a grizzly. Wait till you see their tracks in the sand in the riverbank, yeah. and you're going fishing, and you're not going to go fishing. Now, they don't climb a tree. Francis once had a fascinating neighbor, an old homesteader across the river. We'll visit his place in a moment. I guess they won't be with Francis Wisner, I cross a footbridge built by the Forest Service on the Salmon. We're going to the homestead that belonged to her neighbor, Jim Moore. Jim Moore. Now, he I've was, heard that name. Well, you've heard it. You, you knew Buckskin. Yeah. Uh, in their differences, they were very much alike. That... Uh,
They, they weren't alike at all, and yet they were so much alike. If you knew one, you knew the other. Now, he lived over here. We were going up to his uh, buildings. He came in 98, tired of working for wages and seasonal labor and nothing, and hunting a place that he could scrabble out a living and also have a home. That was the thing he came for, was a place to never have to move again. So now we're going over to see Jim's building. Well, we're going to go over and see the buildings of this young man that had just worked to stay alive. Jim Moore lived by trading with miners and trappers. He died a few years after Francis came here. The old horse barn, when his horses got sick, he didn't turn them out. He kept them in the barn and nursed them till they died and dug a hole and buried them right there. He did. There's one buried in each end of the of the building. Well, how many people live here in this little settlement with him? No one. Just him. This isn't too much for one person that enjoys <laughs> it and he's got his, his living quarters and then he's got his barn and he's got a chicken house over there. This was the last building he put up. Right under, inside there, this is garden tools. He had the the single wheel push cultivator, that can hurt a deer or a horse's nails that are up. Turn them over. It really could, couldn't it? Well, children would yeah. step on it, too, just to see it bounce. Now, what building was this? The garden house, garden. the garden tools and the seed and his bins that were in there that uh, he didn't have to worry about rats and mice getting in his uh, garden seed. You say he had an unusual kind of latch. Well, it um, locked it. Mm -hmm. It was easy to open from inside or outside, and yet the animals had problems. And uh, if there's one of them left anywhere, it's it's very... Boy, can you look at imagine the size of these trees? Well, now, just figure that on a broad axe. And remember, you couldn't use a broad axe with the thing flat. You had to be up standing on it, cutting right between your own mm. toes. Now, this is the it, main house. Dirty. Yeah, this is. And the outside stairway was here. Well, mm -hmm. that door's still on. No one can reach it. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I wish the logs could talk. They'd that, tell you about when the trees were growing and then when they dropped and they found out they were going to make a house for a man. I think those logs enjoyed that house. I don't think they would cry if logs could cry about being cut down and made into a building. I think they have enjoyed being Jim's house. If they could cry, they would cry because nobody has taken care of them since Jim was gone. With the roof, there would be no dry rot. The top log is warping out now. And I'm not strong enough. So I can't put a roof on it either. Lord knows it needs it. You say he picked this place, huh? Yeah. And uh, he said, well, so far as you're concerned, it's easy digging. <laughs> you won't find a rock any bigger than that. And he was right. These were brought in from up on the hill. And he says, uh, someday there's going to be a road up this river. It's too close to the hill. It won't bother me. And on nice spring days, I'll come out and sit on my rock and watch the cars go by. <laughs> Moore's homestead now is protected as part of this national forest wilderness. Frances and I return to her place, and I ask about her life here. Frances, this is beautiful out here. Well, let me ask you something. How did a gal from Corpus Christi, Texas, ever end up on the Salmon River in Idaho? You know, sometimes I ask me that. All I know is I didn't intend to stay, and I come into the mountains, and somehow or other I couldn't leave. It's so far back and so beyond. Living, before I lived here, all of that seems like something I read in a book that I forgot who the author was. You mean life before you moved in? Mm -hmm. Just a different... It, it's more as if I didn't even come alive until I came here. 
And but I wasn't out. Uh, I think the modern phrase is try to find yourself. I was. I guess I'm at the place I I was born to live in. Well, you've been here 40 years. I've known Francis Wisner since the time I came to this Salmon River country to meet Sylvan Hart. I'm sorry now to be leaving her ranch in this remote, spectacular canyon. All outdoorsmen and women, all of us who truly love the wilderness, would surely like the idea of staying here, on and on. I'll see you next time you're in. But I can't help wondering how well we'd really like it as a way of life. How contentedly we could endure the prolonged solitude of winter how successfully we'd meet the challenges of making and doing everything for ourselves, of being almost totally self-reliant. And I can't help wondering how many people like Francis Wisner and Sylvan Hart are left. And will there be any new ones, any more like them in the decades to come? People living apart from our crowded age, our incomprehensible world that often seems out of control. The rewards of that wilderness way of life are clear. The sense of fitting in, of belonging to a place, and of understanding as fully as possible one small part of the earth. I'm glad I met these two remarkable people, and I hope you feel you've met them too. Field has been brought to you in part by your Kmart Sports Center with quality brand names at Kmart prices. Sports Field is a result of the combined efforts and cooperation of the International Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and their associates. Sports Field is approved and recommended by wildlife professionals for its true life presentations.